morning. Welcome to our ladies' school. We're here to capture a few special moments in the life of a gentleman named Mike Bennett. Mike's kind of a humble guy. I don't think he'd like this, but it's time to capture a little, little knowledge about Mike's background. Mike is probably or arguably one of the finest sports photographers anywhere. And he's been adopted by the University of Notre Dame for sports, football, basketball, and so forth. And he's a hometown boy. So, without further ado, let's go, let's go meet Mike Bennett. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. It's uh, June 2019. And after on, after a major determined quest, I finally got a few moments to chat about, about you, which you don't normally do. Can we start with a little bit of background, like um, hometown boy? Sure. Born here? I was born and raised in South Bend. Born in uh, 1950. What hospital? At uh, St. Joe Hospital. And so, um, grammar school? And I went to Lincoln grade school, Riley High School. And um, uh, growing up in uh, in Notre Dame, or <laughs> in this area, my mother was a huge Notre Dame fan. And of course, this was in the 50s before TV. And she had a family tradition that she would gather all the kids on game day in front of the radio. No, um, no TV. Me too. So. She would scream and holler and yell and do all sorts of things. And her famous line was, nab that joker. Nab <laughs> that joker. That's a new one. <laughs> and, uh, and that's basically where I got my, my, my roots in Notre Dame football. Was what was your mother's mother. name? Made a name. Virginia. Virginia. Virginia uh, uh, Hardy. Was Hardy. Her. And she's a obviously Catholic family. Catholic family, yes. Tell me about your dad. Uh, my dad, uh, Jack Bennett, uh, once again born and raised here in, in uh, 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 South Bend. He, uh, he had a heating business. Well, actually, he, <laughs> he taught me quite a few very neat lessons as I was growing up also. Um, he was trying to get a job during the uh, Depression. And there were like a hundred and some people applying for this one job. Mm, and wow. he, 1920s. Yeah, well, it was, yeah, 1930s and mid-30s. Yeah, it started in 29, right? Yeah, right. And he, um, he went, uh, it was his time for the interview, and he started off by saying that he would work for two, or two weeks free if he could get the job. And fortunately, he was the only one that made that offer, and he got the job. Plus, he proved himself. Yes. He wanted to take a gamble and show these fine men. Yes. Yes. Been a good marketing guy. So that was a, yeah. And then he went into his own business? And eventually he ended up with his own business called Home Heating here uh, in Mishawaka. Did you work there a little bit? And actually I did. I worked a couple summers for him. And uh, that was kind of the funny thing that um, uh, back then, of course, they used asbestos for everything. You know, they would wrap sure. the furnaces, the piping, good stuff, and all then. that sort of stuff. And we would go in and tear out these old furnaces and put new furnaces in. Those were so thick that you couldn't see across the basement. So you're breathing all this stuff in, hauling all this stuff out, come out totally dirty. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, quite an experience. But nowadays, you know, when they do it on TV now, they have hazmat suits on. <laughs> they made a big business out of it. I took one out down myself, no trouble. Yeah. The um, so before air conditioning, then there wasn't right. air conditioning going on. That's thing. Right. How about siblings? Uh, I have uh, a, a brother and a sister, brother Jack. Uh, he lives uh, between uh, Wisconsin and Florida. And then, uh, <laughs> well, and, the guy. Then I, and then I have a, a sister, Sharon, who lives primarily in the, in the Keys in Florida, but they do have a summer house here um, on the Lake Commission. Are you allowed access to all these Floridian properties? <laughs> I'm sure their uh, their doors are open. So. That's what I would think. Uh, so. Yes. 
What advice did your mom or dad give you that you kind of remember best? Um, well, in a way, um, and, 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 and Lou Holtz came, up, came along and kind of echoed the sentiment or actually put it down better in words, but basically always do your best, always do the right thing, and always treat others the way you want to be treated. Beautiful. Lou Holtz also told you something about thanking somebody, didn't he? Oh, yes. Yes, he said that you always need to thank people. You need to thank at least 10 people a day. And Regardless of relationship. Right. That is correct. And um, do you have a special memory of your, as a kid, a special memory like um, when you got in trouble or anything special? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, the, the biggest memory as a kid and this is when I was 16. You can still be a kid at 16. Amen. Um, or 60. That's all right. Um, it was a family tradition that all my uh, brother, well, my brother, my uncles, my grandfather, whatever, were Notre Dame ushers. And, and the earliest age that you could become an usher was 16. So a few days after my 16th birthday, my grandfather, Grandpa Hardy, brought me out to the stadium and signed me up as an usher. Out to the stadium or the, or the church? No, no, this is with the stadium. Oh, the, oh, the stadium the usher. The stadium. With the stadium hat, ushers. the yellow hat. Yes, yes. Roger Hibbs, Roger Hibbs move. Yeah. And how yeah. long did you do that? Uh, I, I, I was an usher until 1982 when I started shooting photographs. Jerry Faust. Oh, right straight through there. And you, how many years were you in Usher? Wow. Um, whatever that is. 20, I'm, 20 years? Yeah. Right? It was a while. And that's an unpaid job, isn't it? It's a volunteer yeah, job. It's a volunteer job, yes. And the more time you get, the better, the better location. Uh, well, I, of course, wanted to usher with my father. Oh. And, and he ushered in the senior student section, which led to a lot of interesting stories. Oh, <laughs> the, the, student, the students worked together. What well, one of those stories? I, I didn't know that. Well, they, it was all male. Your father got the, the guys all together. No. Well, he was he was uh, uh, he. They had two captains of each section. Right. He was one of the captains, and and we had maybe sixteen ushers maybe working that section, and it was the senior student, student section, and of course they would always try to sneak in women. <laughs> They would try to sneak in. Like dates? Yeah, dates, oh, uh, dates. Or, or other uh, Friends. liquid refreshments. <laughs> and the students uh, went free in those days, did they not? There was a free ticket then for students. Uh, I believe so. Not I anymore. Believe so. I, I, I don't recall. Today it's a I, modest. I know they all had modest. tickets that they had, yeah. I so we used to have stamp tickets. So in 82, you went to work for the, the school. Tell me, and with Jerry Faust, when he was the... Um, the, the coach. Right. Um, but before that, between high school, Riley High School, that you were in, a, you went into the tool dye business. That is correct. And how many years were in that? Uh, I was in tool dye about four and a half years. Did you do anything there that was um, noteworthy as far as to invent something or create something? It was. Um, well, no. Uh, I was a journeyman tool of diamond, which that's, means that's that union. I went through a, a four-year program. And then I worked about a half a year in the trade, and then I had this opportunity that came along to work uh, as an apprentice in the photo industry. Did you have any experience in photo schools or anything no. like that? No. So you were OJT. Right. And that never went to the, it's not too late for school with now, you should be teaching it, right? <laughs> yeah. OJT is better effective than other things. And then, yeah. um, and so what was your, um, Coach Fowles, tell me about your first game was football. Was it football? Right, game? right. Where? Tell me about it. Okay, first uh, first game, and if you ever listen to Alan Pinkett and his uh, his speeches, he actually mentions me, and he has a photo that sometimes he shows in the, in the speech. Oh, really? Good. But my very first game was in uh, 1982 in Pittsburgh. It was uh -huh. an away game, and at that time Pittsburgh was ranked number one in the country. And uh, being my first game, you know, I didn't know, you know, have an idea of exactly what I was doing. Sure. 
But, well, you had a lot of time around here. Yeah. <laughs> but back then, I, I thought, well, you know, hanging out in the end zones because they're going to come but towards the end zones. For, but this, the, the... You know, the quote somebody, that's where the action comes to them. Right, mm. right. So anyway, so so Alan Pinkett uh, actually ended up running, and it was a 30, 40, 50-yard touchdown. And I was the only uh, photographer in the end zone. As a matter of fact, Mike Collins, who does the announcing now, was actually right. standing next to me. Cool. And so I have a progression of Alan coming down the field and then scoring the touchdown. And uh, uh, by today's standards, they weren't very sharp. <laughs> no, but, but, <laughs> but I captured the moment. That was a camera that had an automatic and, advancement of film? Uh, but, but, that, yeah, it was all film, and right, that was, that and a motor drive. camera belonged to the school? Uh, no, no, no. It's your own? No, uh, that was, all, I, I've always used my own equipment. That you're required to get your own equipment? Yeah. So you had to learn a yeah. lot fast. Well, I, the other thing that, that we didn't mention or whatever is once I, once I uh, uh, left uh, uh, Tool and I, I ended up going to work for this photography studio. Ah, so what was, and the, name, then, what was the name of that? And it was Nep Studio. Maybe pictures, and stuff like that. Or? Uh, no, it was all commercial, industrial. Oh, oh, good stuff. But we we actually shot everything. We shot everything from pigs, uh, livestock to uh, diamonds to food to fashion to. So, whole game. so that was a resume item to kind of help get this job. That's right. Plus the fact that you're in your dad were kind of really well known. Well, yeah. yeah. But so so uh, so anyway. So yeah, I, I progressed through, through right. all of that. Now getting back to Alan Pinkett. Sure. Um, I ended up with these photographs, and I made some prints, and I sent one to the coach, and then a couple other people saw them. Whatever. The South Bend Tribune somehow got a hold of one and then wanted to use it in the following um, uh, Friday paper for the game, next next home game. And so that was my very first published picture uh, was the a South picture Bend that Tribune. I took. When was, what year was that? It was 1982. What was the score of that game? And I'll bet you know the score. I don't know the score. Who won the game? No, Notre, Notre, Notre Dame won the well, game. You know, and I've never seen Notre Dame lose a game, ever. <laughs> I don't think I don't think our cinematographer has either. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so you published one, in the tri first one in the Tribune. Yeah, it was my first photo in the Tribune. Did it go on I Sunday or Monday? What? It, it was. It actually ran on Friday. A week later. Before the game. For the next game. For the next home game, which was back here. Right. And, and right. Was, you know that. Remember that game. That you were then you were you were aboard permanently done doing it. Uh, I shot all of the rest of the home games from that point on and a few of the uh, away games in 82, and then in 83 I started shooting all the games. But you were an independent contractor working for your own business. That is correct, right. I, I was never a direct employee of the university. And um, right. the, um, Jerry Faust was kind, of, was kind of a special guy for you yes. too, wasn't he? Uh, tell me a little about Jerry. Jerry was uh, an unbelievable person. He. Um, he bent over backwards to make you feel at home, very religious. Um, and one day, which which totally shocked me, right? Uh, I came in to practice to drop off some things, and his secretary said, "said uh, uh, Wait a minute, coach wants to see you." And I Not said, "The usual." And I said, "Well, practice is going on. They're practicing. Coach never comes out." No. Practice. Okay, so they're practicing, and, and um, she says, wait a minute, let me get him. So he comes out, and um, he, uh, he gives me this jacket, Notre Dame jacket. Just really? A, yeah, yeah. Very nice, nice would Notre it, Dame It would not jacket. be your last one, though, no, would no, it? No, no, no. no. But, and then he, then he said something that, that really shocked me. He said, I, I understand that you're thinking about starting your own business. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, that can be kind of rough. And he says, if you, if you ever get in a situation where you can't make payroll or have some issues, give me a call and I'll help you out. Now, how many people say that? That's just to his character. I've known a few, but boy, they're rare. They're rare. And he was dead serious. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard it. Like, because how long was he coach? I uh, have what he coached from 80 to 84, and what Coach Holtz 
took over at 85. Yeah, he was, um, is he still with us, Jerry Faust? Oh, yes. Yeah. I can't remember one after he went to some other team, I think. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the um, you mentioned something about, you've been around Notre Dame, this is your 37th year coming up? Right. Right. right? And the number in basketball is, how many in basketball? Well, I, I did, it took me a few years to start shooting some basketball. And I didn't really start shooting, you know, all the games probably until men and around women? 2000. Both yeah. men and women? Yeah, around 2000, 99 maybe. So you've been like about that. 15, 16, 17 years in the basketball arena. Capturing Enrique? Enrique. Yeah, Enrique. I'm, I'm nuts about her. <laughs> and, the, uh, and so you made a comment to somebody about after all these years, you've been at between you got 37 in photography, and you have a few years hanging out before that, another 20. Um, you said something about the tunnel when you go down the tunnel. Yes, yes, every time I walk down the tunnel, and some people don't believe me and whatever, but it's, it is actually true that every time I walk through that tunnel, I get goosebumps. Mm -hmm. And it's when you think about the, the um, everything that's happened there, and uh, yeah, it's a very, very special place. The, um, what do you consider your best quality? Put, put the humility aside. What do you consider your best quality? Showing up. <laughs> As it, like today. Showing up. Yeah. And, yeah. and you can't say enough about that um, uh, for anybody. No. You don't have to have talents. You don't have to have anything. But if you show up and show a drive and a true passion for something. Maybe Lombardi time. It'll work out. The, uh, you've heard of Lombardi time. Yeah. yeah I, I, uh, who was the most influential person in your, uh, your life? Oh, wow. Well, I have to say my wife to start with. Susan. Susan. Yeah, Susan. Good photographer, too. And yes, yes. We shoot together. Yep. And the, um, the, um, what's the nicest thing any one person's ever done for you? Well, once again, my wife. Yes. But like marrying um, you, right? Yeah. yeah that Where was did a, you meet her in high school? Or no, uh, <laughs> a little known fact. Uh, back uh, when I in high school, when I was senior in high school, I was drum major of the band. You were what the band? Drum major. Drum major. Drum those major. guys have a bad rep. And uh, well, those guys are. You know. <laughs> and head of the drum section for a couple of years ahead uh -huh. of that. And. Um, so when I got out, I still wanted to do something, stay active in something, and I hooked up with a um, uh, drum and baton corps uh, in Mishawaka. At that time it was called uh, Gills Tourlerets, which later turned into Royal Majestics. And um, uh, her sister was a baton twirler. She didn't twirl baton, but um, uh, she played bells, and she ended up in the drum section. So. We had kind of a relationship there, and we kind of grew from there. And she was as, in the same school? Or no. Going to school? No. Well, Susan was where? Uh, well, she graduated. She was the last graduating class from Jackson High School. Right. Back in 75. And you have three children. We have three daughters. Three daughters. Really, one very attractive photographer, too, named Michelle. 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 And the other two? The other two, um, well, our oldest daughter is Buffy, and she... Buffy. Buffy. B-U-F-F-Y. Buffy. Buffy. That's and a nickname. No, no. That's, that's her actual name. Wow. Buffy Sue. Okay. And um, she actually works in the treasurer's office now for St. Joe County. Uh-huh. Uh, and our middle daughter is Jamie. Jamie. And she is a assistant uh, uh, physical therapist, and she works in the... Uh, uh, extended facility cares around the area. Raised three kids, and all squared away. Yes. What? A, tell me about the grandchildren. Seven. Seven grandkids. Seven. Yeah. I don't think it's... Oh yeah. <laughs> we got a bet to the grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, well, Virginia, which she just graduated, she's 18. Uh, she's Buffy's. Um, and Cadence, uh, which is Michelle's daughter, right. uh, she graduated uh, last week. So they're both 18, and then um, I guess I'll do this by families. Uh, so there's Virginia, Rebecca, and uh, Ellen, and 
she and those three belong to my oldest daughter, Buffy. Then Jamie has two boys, Nicholas and Lane. And then Michelle has a boy and a girl, Ethan and Cadence. Lucky guy. Yes. You know, I have a daughter, and I raised a young man too, but I've had to do over again, I'd want all daughters. Something special. Yes. You know, the, um, ever notice that the phones are never busy on Father's Day? <laughs> and the, the thing, when the camera goes around, the football players here at Notre Dame, they don't say hi, Dad. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, give me a, do you have um, um, any kind of philosophy on you know, young people? What would you tell them? What would, any philosophy about how to succeed in life? You tell young people. Yeah. Well, we actually go back to the same thing. Right. Show up. Always, now, well, always do the right thing. Always do your best. And always treat others. Tell me about um, your remark about let the action, let the action, let the action come to you. Okay. Well, right spot. well okay, when you shoot any sports, um, you know, a lot of photographers think, well, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to shoot what comes to me or what happens or what I can or whatever. And yes, that's, that's a major part of it because you, you don't have control of anything. But what you do have control of is preparation. And what I mean by that is being in a location where you might get the higher percentage shot. Right. Um, if you're looking for the, the single shot, the shot that you know that you want to see on a magazine cover or whatever, those are rare, far in between, and you have to really, really plan and you have to really, really get lucky. Sure. Now, when you when you decide you're going to do that, you're probably ruling out about 95% of the other shots. Mm -hmm. And I never felt that was a priority for me. I'm not that kind of guy. You almost have to be in some cover. sports, you almost have to be in danger to get a good shot. Well, there there is always danger in any in any sports activity sure. because, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate that I've, I've been hit by footballs before, but I've never actually been flattened by a player. No linebackers. No linebackers. And, but, all, once again, all part of that is knowing and hearing and smelling yes. <laughs> when someone is coming toward you. a sense, a sixth sense. That's right. But That's right. Develop. And you always got to be sure that nobody's standing behind you that you have to escape route. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. If you were in my shoes, what, would I, what, what should I have asked you today? <laughs> what, did you, what, what did you want me to ask you today? Well, that's a good question. I, I'm, uh, have you, uh, as you've noticed, I'm kind of a private person. Amen. And I've been working on this for about six, seven years. When, when I started in the business, um, Chuck Linster, who did the films for Notre Dame, the, uh, 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 the coaches' films, and back then it was all in film, there was no video. And he was basically a journalist, and he actually also worked for WADU right. as, a, as an on-camera guy. Right. And he always told me, he says, you're there to record, not to participate. And, and I've always taken that to heart that, you know, when I go in and when I take a photograph of any of the coaches or, or anybody that has a very restricted time limit, I feel that they don't really care about my small talk. They don't want to be, you know, uh, bothered by what I might have you to say. You and I know one of those coaches. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm always right. direct to the point, yeah. um, and which in, in, in some ways kind of makes me like I'm antisocial. But I, you know, I mean, that just comes with the territory. I'm really not. I'm, I'm you know, a very friendly person, I think. But, uh, you know, that's something that I have to overcome. But, yeah, I'm, I always stay in the background. I, I, I've had one coach that had coached here and left and went to someplace else. And then he was talking to me about their photographer. Right. And he says, he says, I can't stand this guy because he's always in my face. You know, and, me to show. and videographers, uh, uh, the same way, you know, they, they have to feel that they have to be exactly. in your face and, and whatever. And, you know, with all of the lenses and technologies and whatever, you can get a much better photograph 20 feet away than you can from three. So, 
so yeah, so that's that's part of the... You've seen the camera technology. Oh, when you started, you had film. That's right. And you had to go back and develop that. That's right. You had to hang on, dark room, all that. That is correct. That is How correct. many years were you doing film? Uh, well, from <laughs> from the very beginning, which I actually started in in photography in 1975, right. uh, or actually 1974, and I was doing using film all the way up until 2005, when I felt that the, the quality was getting better. Were you hesitant to go digital? Not in 2005. No, no. no there was no doubt that digital was Arrived. better and you could do more with it and and the people that say that old film is still great i say hey if you like it use it but it's not no there's a bunch of snobs that way but too bad kodak wasn't paying attention yes the um what's it like coming back on a flight should i don't i have no recollection but if should notre dame had notre dame would have, should have lost it lost the game what's it like coming back on a flight like that different okay well, if they lose the game, everything is very quiet. Very, very quiet. If they win the game, everything, everyone is very, very loud. Exuberant. And, and, yeah, dancing and whatever. And, and that's the other thing, too. You know, Notre Dame athletes, and this is not football, it's all the athletes, right. are all very, very special people. Yes. Um, uh, out of thousands of athletes, I would just say We're not Notre Dame material. Maybe they shouldn't have been here. Maybe they shouldn't have been here. But most of the time, I might have, I have players that come up and hug. Do you have any players you've been with your whole life here, you know, a long time? Well, um, Ruth Riley is one. She comes to mind. There are a lot of others. Chris Sowich. Great guy. Sure. I, one of the comments I get trouble for is that when NCAA, when um, Notre Dame plays Navy, one of the few moments, and perhaps Stanford too, when both teams could read and write. That's why <laughs> Notre Dame people are different. Yes. Our standards here are so strong. Let's get a little lighter moment here. Yes. <laughs> Let's it up here. We uh, Give me your favorite movie, all my favorite movie. <laughs> oh boy. I. Because that reveals a lot about people. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's my all-time favorite, but, but Rudy, because I was here when they were filming it. Oh, that's right. And, and I had a... Did you do it till clicking then? Uh, had some, uh, and I was, I was allowed, I was the only non-actor right, right. <laughs> allowed to shoot that final scene. Were you in from camera? The end, were you so in, I was no, not on no. camera. No, 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 I made it. But you were doing that scene where they, they, ha they stopped the whole stadium to do yeah, that scene. That is correct. And, yeah. and that in itself was, that was a, at halftime or what was half time. Time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they totally transformed the, the stadium into a movie set for that. Yeah. What's, his, uh, what's it, Sean? Uh, what's the boy? Sean Aston. Well, we met my daughter and I had time. Yeah. yeah. Nice guy. But yeah, that was a, that was a tremendous. Uh, and and I know Rudy also. Right. And, oh yeah. Who doesn't know Rudy? And uh, you know, and, and not everything is always no. told about that story either. But he is a great guy. And, Sometimes. And when you're doing a great story or movie or something like that, you can't, you let, you gotta let reality slip a little bit. Yeah. Part of it is entertainment. Yeah. What's your favorite book? What kind of books do you read? <laughs> oh, I don't read a lot of books. <laughs> you read all the Notre Dame stuff? I, uh, the, uh, uh, Newt Rockney, All American. I've had a chance to read, uh, part of. Did you say Canute Rockney? Canute Rockney. Okay, that's what yeah. I heard. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, um, uh, Canute himself wrote a book uh, on football, which, uh, well, the copy I read came out of the archives. <laughs> Did you read, um, and how many times have you read The Kipper's Ghost? I haven't. Uh,
Okay, so they're both, I think we're more as an athlete. Yeah. Very really athletic. What about yeah. a male? You don't have John, no John Wayne's in your life? Oh, uh, well, you know, I mean, all the classics. Yeah, right. I, I like uh, John Wayne and all the. I'm like, not into anybody really. I have, I've liked current. everything. I've liked yeah. much since World War II. Yeah. Okay, now let's, let's skip over to uh, ladies' basketball. This school, boy, have they done something in women's sports. And that, that lady with the red, red, the red shoes. Tell me right. about her. Right. Well, I, I uh, of course, uh, Muffet came, you know, while I was here, and it, it took me a few years to, to even shoot a game. And um, but Muffet and I have, Muffet, and my wife and I have a great relationship. And her, excuse me, and her husband Matt. Uh, Matt is a, a wonderful guy, and um, he's the. He's the man behind the coach. <laughs> uh, he keeps everything on the rails. But um, uh, Muffet, um, I, I can't say enough about her. She, uh, uh, they asked me to cover the 2000 uh, national championship game in St. Louis, and of course Notre Dame won. And uh, a few weeks after the, the game was over. I got a call from the equipment manager out here, and she said, well, we need your ring size. I said, what do you need my ring size for? And she says, well, it wants to give you a national championship ring. How did she get it you personally? Yes, she did. Did she put it on? Yeah. She, wow. uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which was really terrific. And, and, you know, this was one of the things that just kind of knocked me off my feet. But, but anyway, a couple of years later, in 2000, you get choked up sometimes. I do. Yeah. In 2003, um, uh, I had a heart attack, and it was in August, and I was in coronary care for three or four days. And what time of year was that? That was in August. Oh, I'm sorry, summertime. Yeah, right. Yeah, August 17th. Off season. And um, well, actually, the season had just football season had just picked up then. Right. And so uh, I, got out, I got out of coronary care and I wasn't in a, a, a room um, longer than an hour and a half, two hours, and I hear a knock on the door and there's nothing. And uh, wow, that was, that was pretty important. I thought she was kind of a, when I was just chatting with her, she's a very, not only respected, super likable person. Yes. That's why you two are on the same uh, on the same same wavelength. Yeah, what a great so. story. Anybody else visit you? Well, I was only there another day and a half, which was good for me. But no, but 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 part of that story also is, you know, I kind of felt an obligation to try to get back in and shoot as quick as I could, sure, as much as I could, sure. And so um, the very first football game. out for warm-ups and, and once again you got to understand that the coaches are all focused they're always focused on the game and what's happening and whatever and he made a point of coming over to the sideline well Mike let's talk a little bit about coach Lou Holtz yes he's not really Japanese is he <laughs> your photographer is Japanese but he went to Japan yes okay yes uh, I had the opportunity in 2008 um, the Alumni Association put together an alumni football team, all from former Notre Dame players. And they had tryouts, and um, this was... Legends, they call them legends. legends. Yeah. One guy yeah. was like 50, wasn't he? One guy was 50, Chris Haynes uh, was up there. The uh, quarterback. Tony Rice, Tony Rice, yeah. Tony Rice was, a, was a quarterback. Uh, Chris Orich. However, Chris did not play. Um, and um, anyway, so we had a couple practices here uh, in uh, uh, and workouts right. and whatever here. And, and then before we left, we flew over to Japan. And that was a huge... Uh, Logistical time zone? Yeah, right. Time jet, jet lag? Right. Right. What hotel did you stay out there in Japan? It was the Ritz, wasn't it? The Ritz, yeah. You know, in the lobby of the Ritz, it was the first time a really nice guy introduced me personally to Lou Holtz. 
Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you just probably think, who's this guy? Yeah. Lou was another guy that would really, I mean, he, he is a great coach and probably a better person. Um, he would do anything for you, you know, help you out if you needed. He was very uh, conscious and concerned about his players. And anybody that ever heard Lou talk, you know, I mean, you, everybody knows Lou. Everybody. He's done some good stuff for me. Yes. Too. Yeah. A wonderful yes. human being. The, um, uh, you, uh, Notre Dame sent you traveling a few times. Um, tell me about the Middle East trip. Okay. Well, there, uh, we ha I had an, once again had an opportunity to go with uh, Coach Weiss to the Middle East in 2009. And um, uh, actually, I went as his personal photographer because the personnel on the trip was actually right. limited as to who could go and whatever. But um, we started out at uh, Cutter in the, um, uh, of course, we flew in at night and uh, very, everything obviously very strange for flying into the desert. And we flew over in a C-130, oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, it was a, uh, a tanker, a uh, C-135. A C-135 tanker, right? Thank you. And um, as you probably know, those are not made for comfort. Comfort. The restrooms are kind of unique. Yes. Uh, but the in in all of the information we had, we're going to the desert. You know, very hot and whatever, and and down on what did you board the C-135? Uh, it. Uh, Clark Air Force Base in St. Louis. That far in the U.S. Yes. You took the C-135 all the way there. Right. No, now right. you didn't have to refuel, did you? We we stopped at uh, at uh, Ramstein. Sure, uh, Germany. Germany. That's where the refuel. hospital is near. We visited Frankfurt. the hospital. Right. Yep. And then. Uh, and so then St. Louis to Ramstein is an incredible distance. Yes. Of course, that's a tanker. Yeah. 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 But. They, they, in the in the information packet, they also said bring boots, gloves, a heavy winter coat, and a hat. And you know, we shouldn't make sense at all. A hat? A hat. A, a, a stocking cap. A stocking cap. They a stocking cap. Did they have a sleeping bag? Yeah, no sleeping bag. Wouldn't that have been nice on that plane? So, yeah. what we found out is that was basically for the plane ride. Um, the heating of the plane ran through the center of the plane and they had these hoses that dropped down. And if you were next to a hose, you roasted any place else you actually froze. That's why I take sleeping bags. Yeah. They, they, uh, they had water, you know, bottled water, right. and, and, and as it was sitting on the floor, it froze. Right. Uh, and every place else, uh, you know, I mean... How yeah. many people were in your group? Uh, the total group was about 20... 22, 24, something like that. But was that it, included the, other coaches. The the five other coaches or four other coaches, and then um, uh, the video crews and personnel. Were you the only still photo or, photographer? I was just doing still. Right. Yeah. And uh, did some on the plane. And did some on the plane. I'd love to see those. Yeah. 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 So so they did box launches stuff like that. <laughs> well, they had a they had a skid full of food, uh -huh. and it was mostly sandwiches and stuff and whatever. Sure. You just took whatever you sure, wanted. But sure. They, yeah, you must have been shot when you landed in Germany. So, it was it was a very interesting trip. But when we got to to Cutter, and um, not you know once again all new and whatever, right, right. and and so they took us to the command center. Right. And uh, the command center was for the entire theater, which was uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But and years is now. Hmm? What year were we talking about? What year? 2009. Well, so we're well into the war by that time. Right. So Iraq was actually kind of winding down. Yeah, but Afghanistan there six years. Was, yeah. Pick it up. Yeah. And and they they took us into the command center, which I wasn't allowed to take pictures inside there. But they, they I felt they gave us way too much information. But they were trying to portray exactly what right. we were doing there and why we were there. Right. And, and I mean, I have some stories I could tell, but I probably shouldn't. Then you have to shoot us. <laughs> What's that? Then you have to shoot us, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but it, it's unbelievable. And a couple things I learned about that trip was that um, 
We are extremely, extremely lucky that we have the personnel in our armed forces that we have. Aren't they great? They are. Less than 1% of America are. Yes, but I mean, it's the creep. And we create some really good, over here at the Pasquale Center, we create some really tough guys, top yeah. guys. I think most of them are Marines. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, walking into this, yeah, right. walking into this building, and right. it's a huge building, and there's these boxes, these big, huge boxes sitting around, pointing all different directions. And it looks like, you know, it looks like a, uh, a, a big dome-like yeah, building. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the no, the building was a warehouse. Okay, but inside the individual convex boxes, like shipping boxes. Well, outside the building. Right. Outside the building, and these were big boxes. Right. Huge. So I asked somebody, I said, well, you know, these things are all over the place. What are those? And they said, well, they're Patriot missiles. <laughs> oh, different. Yeah. <laughs> Says, they you know, should have they have to right. protect. They should have been telling you. The command center. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they were all Patriot missiles, and they were everywhere. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, we're a target. We're a target. I, um, have you had much time with the photograph? Have you got anything with the military besides that trip? Um, not a lot. Besides that trip, but a couple things I got to tell you, tell you about the trip. We went to a, uh, a, a, a amphib an amphibian assault ship in the Arabian Sea. Okay. So they took us out by helicopter, and it was a big. Remember the name? Big helicopter. The name of the helicopter? The ship. Uh, it was NASA. USS NASA. And um, uh, so before we got on the helicopter, I, I asked. Um, can I take photos of the ship when we get close? Right. And and they said, oh, sure, yeah, yeah no problem at all. Sure. So you're wearing a, a, a life preserver and a helmet and right. goggles and all this sort of stuff. And so the chief of the, of the, the crew chief kind of motions towards me. And I get up and, and he has this harness that he puts on and it's a gun harness. You know, and it's right. like, a right. you know, no way you can get out of it. Right. And it has a long tether on it. And he hooks me into the rail of the helicopter, and then he opens the door. So I can hang out the side of the helicopter as we're approaching the ship. A lot of people wouldn't do that for a million dollars, right? <laughs> well, for photo, if I, yeah. If I, when I have a camera in my hand, I can, I could do almost anything. <laughs> because you want that shot. That's right. Everybody wants that one best shot. So anyway, so so we're so I'm hanging out of the helicopter and I'm taking these photos, and the crew chief yells in my ear and says, "Are we close enough for you know?" Or, and I said, "Well, this is good, you know." And I'm yelling at him, yeah. "This is good, but you know, if we could get just a little bit lower," and he says, "No problem." <laughs> so radios the pilot, the pilot drops down and does another 360 hot around stuff, hot stuff around the, around the, the ship, and the, and the one thing I I. I'll go ahead and say, but <laughs> some of the coaches were not enjoying that helicopter oh, ride. Oh, sure. And as a matter of fact, a few of the coaches were turning green. The, 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 and I've been on those scenes where they kind of regurgitate. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I extended, yeah. I extended the trip by about four or five minutes. So they, so they never found out about that. So they didn't know. They didn't know. Or they would have sent you to a special guy. Uh, there, or I probably would have been <laughs> swimming back. Yeah. <laughs> the, how long did you stay on the ship? Uh, overnight. Oh, right. So you had the regular... Right. right. There's a lot of Marines on the USS NASA. Yes. An amphibious ship. Yes. Yes, and that's what they do. NASA right. was the first Marine amphibious battle ever. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, you must have... Um, so anything more in the Middle East trip? That was a grand trip. You're, it was. Well, a footnote. Did you come back on the Air, For Air Force transportation too? We, we came back on the same plane. We always had the same plane. Same crew. And we flew into uh, Andrews Air Force Base, Washington, oh, D.C. Great place. And we ended up in the White House. Dynamite. With the President of the United States. Who was named? Bush. George Bush. George W. Bush. Yes. And um, he spent about 30, 35 minutes with us Indeed. on Memorial Day. And he's a pilot. In the White House. Wow. And, and it was. It was one of those things that you had to pitch yourself to say, sure. am I really here doing this? Did you this? have any helicopter time in the D.C. area? Any helicopter? No. no. Okay. But Andrews, no. and after Andrews, you refueled and went to St. Louis? Well, actually, from there, we took a, a private jet back to Notre Dame. Private? Yeah. Okay. 
Wow. But that was a, and I could talk for hours and hours about, about the Middle East trip. It's well, that's for our um, Mike Bennett, um, son of Mike Bennett movie. Right. <laughs> Next one. Well, you might talk about, a, what's the word? In New Orleans, they call it a platonic dish. Or talk about there's the one platonic, there's one, there's got one or two photographs that you're really, we're going to put something in the Smithsonian in your photos. What would it be? In all honesty, I don't think I have one. Wow, but they're all, a lot of them are in the same class. Well, here's the thing. As a photographer, you're always looking for the next shot. You're always looking for sure. that. So I haven't really achieved that. Good, that's, you know, that's the way, that's what it should be. Um, but if I were, if I had a committee, <laughs> if I was on a committee of three or four of your, uh, your, your pals, what would we have chosen from all your photos? What do people most talk about? What well, would Susan say? The uh, 1988 uh, football championship in the locker room afterwards in, in with the guys Arizona. in Arizona, with the guys uh, you know, singing the fight song. The, uh, rap, the rapid fire one. The uh, obviously women's basketball. From, oh yes, from, uh, yes. 2001 and now yes. 2018. Right. Right. Uh, a lot there uh, that broke our heart at one pointer yeah. now a lot of people ask that question what's your favorite and you know I that's what I normally say but I can tell you the hardest thing that I've ever done in photography please and this is really hard back and and I apologize because uh, the years kind of all blend together but there were two uh, two Mishawaka police officers, officers that were killed in the line of duty. And one was a huge um, Notre Dame fan. His name was Tom Roberts. And he had come into our place a couple times and wanted photos for his Notre Dame room, whatever. And, and uh, the, the killings themselves were very senseless. It was over a necklace and that some guy I don't know. Anyway, he ended up and came out of his house and shot one in the face and the other in the back, and um, and they were both killed. Um, and so Tom Roberts' family asked the state police, who were handling the things at the time, if some, if if actually, if I could take photographs of the funeral, Ooh. and Ooh. that. It was very, very difficult. Sure. Very difficult. You knew them too. The state, uh, state police. You know, I was with a, with an officer. He got me in every place I needed to go. But the main thing was not to be seen, not to interrupt, and just try to record. But that was uh, it, very good. Very good. Very good. You answer my question yet about what photo Susan would have picked for your number one oh. sports photo. Let's go back to sports here before I start getting all choked up. Um, I, she probably would have picked the uh, the uh, locker room scene also. Sure. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of the tens of thousands of people who have met you and even more that have seen your photographs, you're a uh, your Notre Dame treasure. You know, you are a member of the Monogram Club. Yes. Did you meet that Indiana State um, State Trooper, Sergeant Tim McCarthy? Yes. Any time with him? Oh, yes. Yeah. And how about Murph? Is he a member of the Monogram Club? Murph at the bars. Did he join the Monogram Club? I think he is, too. I don't but know. That was, a, tell, tell, that was a surprise. Tell me about the surprise of the Monogram Club. Then we'll wrap up. Tell me about... Well, the monogram occasionally... Um, it's for top athletes that went to the school here, right? That's correct. The monogram club is a very elite um, club. Right. And um, uh, they occasionally give an honorary monogram to someone that, that um, they, for whatever reason, they have criteria they go through, but... Um, I don't, it's something that I don't 
feel that I fit into or really deserve. But um, a lot of people would challenge that. Yeah, I know. The, the um, they never tell. Uh, they never make it public. It's always a surprise. So I'm photographing the monogram dinner in 2003, and um, I'm. John Heisberg was the speaker at the time, and he was talking about... He a gifted you know, writer. Oh, yes. John is a tr tremendous person. So, so anyway, so he starts... He mentions my business phone number, which kind of caught my attention. And then I, you know, what, you know, what is he talking about there? Right. And he keeps going on and going on, and, and, and then he calls my name. And, you know, it's, it's like a bolt of lightning that, you know, what... What, what what's happening here? I don't understand what's happening here. So they call me up on the stage. Dave Durison, which I don't know you know the history of Dave, um, but he was the presenter. You didn't know right time. up to the last second. Oh no, no. <laughs> Did they have your size and everything? Oh yeah, yeah. They have everything. And, and Did this. Did Susan know? Susan knew. Yeah, because they have the families that are hiding in the back. So, and this is the exact coat or coat that they gave me. This is the, the one they gave me in 2003. What is the button, the monogram button? Is it a, a button? Yeah. yeah. But, um, uh, so anyway, they, they present you with this, and then they expect you to say something intelligently. As you're getting ready to go, yeah. I choked up. And, uh, you know, I can't remember exactly what I said and, and whatever, but uh, I made it through the night. And then the next morning, when I got up in the morning, it was still, it was all just like a dream. You had to so go to see if it was there. I, I <laughs> physically had to go to the closet and see if this jacket was there yeah. in order to know that it really was the dream. But, so anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, I didn't wear it for a long time because it was such a great honor and I felt like it. Michael. And then Father Reilly, who was the, the uh, director, well, he was the director of the Monogram Club at that time. And uh, this was a couple months later, and at one of the football luncheons, and he grabbed my arm and he said, I see you're not wearing your monogram. And I said, well, you know, I mean, it's such a great honor, and I don't really, you know, think I should. And he, he, <laughs> he pulled me a little closer and says, you better start wearing it or we're going to take it back. <laughs> I don't blame him. So, right. I, I probably wear it. Well, you should. This is, I've done biographies before. I've never learned or enjoyed one more. Michael, that lady on top of the dome, be very, very proud of you. Thank you. Back to Miss Tokyo.